Welcome to the FMCG Guys, the podcast that dives into the innovation, strategy, and trends shaping consumer goods and retail in Europe and beyond. Welcome to the FMCG Guys podcast. I'm your co-host, Daniel Torres Dwyer. I'm accompanied today by no other than Christina Nicolau. Christina, how are you? Hi, Daniel. I'm doing well. How are you? Very good. Very good as well. And let me wish our audience a happy new year. Um, Because now we're in 2023. So we're talking from the past to the future of 2024. I wonder if there's like flying cars already around or something. Yes, and uh, my shoelaces are tying themselves, I guess. Uh, It's super trippy that we're doing that. Take me to the future. Take me to the future. So to our audience, thanks for joining us in yet another episode. Um, You're Just so you know, you're probably one of the 10,000 followers we have on LinkedIn. That's how good our future looks like. Um, And yeah, thanks again for your following. We love to have built this community and we're very excited to do more and more things this year. Remember that we're part of a family of podcasts and our sister podcast is called the CPG Guys. They bring the latest in consumer packaged goods, as they call it in the US. Um, It's Sri, Peter and Brian. They themselves have a huge amount of knowledge, which is uh, enviable. And they bring a lot of good guests from all over North America. And I'm not going to tell you what audience they have, because it's going to make us look small. So, Christina, very ex- it's actually interesting that a lot of people do dry January, but today we're not going to talk about anything dry. We're going to talk about the world of whiskeys. And as somebody yes. that's worked in the category before, why why is there this like fascination around whiskeys? You know, everybody knows what an on the rocks is without even having to mention the the word whiskey. Uh, I guess first of all, and that was one of my big learnings in the Azio. Uh, most probably everyone is a whiskey drinker, but they still haven't tried the right whiskey yet. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, the five sure, euro whiskey I used to buy to go out when I was young probably was not the right way to, to like be a connoisseur. Yeah, try and do what's your whiskey at whatsyourwhiskey.com is a great tool to figure out what is the right flavor for your palate. Uh, but I guess there is more interest in whiskey than just the amazing. Um, uh, uh, flavors that you can get, uh, which is also whiskey is a great investment. It's growing really, really fast. I think it's probably a better investment than gold. And don't quote me on that. I need to look this up. But I remember Everybody, reading our this. Ten thousand followers will quote you on that now. Yes. Okay. I ha- I have to confirm, but I remember reading an article on this, but it was like a couple of years ago. Um, But I guess this is what the conversation is going to be about today, because it's on one hand how we're digitizing the purchases of whiskey bottles, uh, but on the other hand, on how we're digitizing the contracts that allow you to own a collectible or own a part of a cask. Um, And this goes way beyond just the great flavor that an 18-year-old single malt can have. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm very curious to speak with our guest today. His name is Rob Hollands, and he's the chief executive officer of Metacast, which is a high-end luxury whiskey pure player that offers unique bottles, casks, and more. So you can check them online as we speak. And here's um, Rob Hollands. Um, I'm Rob Holland. I'm the CEO uh, of, of an up-and-coming tech startup called Metacask, um, who's we're, we're really focused in the drink space, and I think we'll we'll talk a bit about that as we go on. Um, but I've had a, had a really varied history of kind of almost 20 years in the creative and marketing um, industry, very, very focused on FMCG. Um, I originally studied uh, marketing at uni. I tried to get onto an e-commerce course, but it was bang on the 
um, dot com mm -hmm. bubble bursting. Uh, so the e-commerce course was pulled in at the time. It was said, you know, this stuff won't take off and uh, digital won't be a big thing. But I kind of stuck with uh, an instinct that it would. Uh, and I've spent the last, yeah, as I say, the last kind of two decades trying to find the bridge between digital um, and physical. And I've done that largely working within agencies um, for FMCG uh, companies. Great predictions, those people at the university, I guess, spot on. <laughs> Pulling that e-commerce course. Yeah, right? Yeah. Digital one day off. But tell us a little bit more about Metacast Corp. What is it? How was the idea born? What is happening there? What's the value you're bringing into the whole spirits industry now? Yes, yeah, so Metacast really focused on looking at looking at ways that technology can solve problems for um, brands, and as I say, kind of drinks companies in particular. Um, the company was actually set up, a guy, a guy called Nim, who's our CTO um, and co-founder of the business, um, set up Metacast because he went to try and purchase or get invest in the cask space. Um, big fan of whiskey in particular um, and luxury spirits, but was finding ownership and proof of ownership and transparency and provenance really, really difficult um, to find. Uh, he'd been doing lots of work at the time in the blockchain space. Um, which the technology, you know, mixed in with crypto and lots of confusion around that. But um, blockchain as a technology, particularly for supply chain, has lots of lots of validation points. Um, so he found it really difficult. He he looked at it, couldn't find out much about ownership. It was hard to trade, and was like, this just doesn't fit the digital world we're living in. Mm -hmm. um, how can I fix that? Uh, and and pretty much set about on the on the Metacast journey to to do that. And can you tell us a bit more of like for dummies like me, <laughs> what it means, like what the whole ownership aspect means around whiskey? Like I, as far as I know, it ownership of whiskey for me was to buy a bottle and drink it up. Yeah, so I guess so. We're we're, st we're still doing lots of work with brands in that kind of I guess the more um, regular consumer of spirits that might be buying you know a thirty, fifty, hundred dollar bottle of spirits. Um, so we're doing lots of work there around. Still, you might care about the ingredients um, to know that it's a genuine product and to engage with the brand itself. So we we talk a lot around connected bottle and how can we weave technology into the bottle itself to engage with consumers uh, in that kind of use case. Um, if you were going higher end, if you're starting to spend thousands um, on a product, and it doesn't just have to be a spirits bottle, could be a handbag if if that's what's taking your fancy, then that considered purchase, you're starting to care a lot more about that initial ownership. You know, is it a genuine product? Um, what am I going to get beyond that product? Um, and then there's a whole secondary market, particularly with spirits around, you know, I've bought this beautiful bottle of Macallan. I've bought it as an investment. I might not actually ever physically take ownership of it i might store it in a in a warehouse somewhere um but i want that when that ash there appreciates i want to sell it on in the future um and that tradition has been really opaque you wouldn't you know taking ownership of that product's not very clear um and, and blockchain can fix that you know this immutable proof of ownership um i can see who's owned it before it's entire its entire journey, where it was originally produced. Um, and when I receive that product or digitally or physically, I can actually take genuine ownership of it and stamp my details on that product. Lots, lots mm. of other industries trying to digitally transform in this way. Um, this isn't just the spirits industry. You look at stuff like real estate, it very, yeah. very paper-based, very traditional, um, confusing, complex, takes long periods of time, Where, wherever those challenges exist there's you know te technology the digital journey everyone's on moves much faster than that are you a savvy consumer insight professional with an interest in ai applications and market research discover bull chat ai the pioneering ai powered qualitative consumer research platform that's reshaping the consumer insight landscape Picture this scenario, effortlessly connecting with your target audience, posing bespoke questions, and receiving insightful responses to address your business queries, all neatly compiled into an actionable report within a mere 24 hours. Bullchat AI streamlines the research process, enabling you 
to make agile, well-informed decisions at a fraction of the conventional cost. Curious to experience the efficiency firsthand? Visit www.bullchatai.com and embark on your free trial today. So is it more for, for like, is it for whiskey aficionados or like investors? So, Are you looking to have an investment or is it like, I really like this whiskey, I want to buy a cask and in like 15 years when it's matured, I get a bottle of sip to my house. So we're, we're actually seeing, we're seeing users across all of those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, whiskey is one of those things, just a huge passion point and spirits in general, actually. And drink, right. And it's part of the fabric of our lives. Um, people really care about the brands and the heritage that sit behind them. Um, so we're seeing it across all cases. Some people are actually going, you know, I mean, I've got got lots of money. I want to make an investment. I want to do it in the digital way that I'm used to with other assets like shares now. And yet they're buying cars. You know, our um, the first cast that Metacask sold was a $2.4 million McAllen cask um, from, from, Whoa. from quite a few decades ago. So, you know, that is someone that's making a purchase um as a as a real investment but we've also we've just launched a campaign on the site that's three four hundred euro bottles um which is much more about you know taking digital ownership of physical assets for a different type of consumer mm. what well, can you tell us a bit more about like what's behind this cult following of whiskey yeah do you know what I, I feel a bit of a fraud sometimes when talking about this because i'm not actually a massive whiskey drinker i'm i'm learning rapidly um, but it's it that you know at any time there's hundreds of conventions of events happening around the whiskey space um i've had the privilege over the last six months of visiting quite a few distilleries and i mean they are absolute amazing brand worlds with hundreds of years worth of heritage and you you quickly start to fall into the love story i guess that is that is whiskey um, because it just it just has such a rich history and craftsmanship that goes into the product, so that that adds a lot of value. And I love that. I've you know spent a lot of my career working with pet food and um, other products where perhaps there's not quite the same emotional attachment. You no, know, certainly is with pets, but uh, maybe not with the, the the dog food or the cat food itself. And we try to layer on those stories. But with something like whiskey, I mean, and spirits in general, there's a really rich tapestry that sits behind the product. Yeah, because then you you have the t- traditional like Scotch or I mean Scotland I think is really like the the place for whiskey. But then you have Irish whiskey, American whiskey, yeah. Japanese whiskey also has a huge cult Definitely. following, doesn't it? Absolutely. So. Yeah, and it's exactly the same. We talk a lot about Scotch whiskey, and it's been a big um, kind of playground for us with the platform. Um, but yeah, bourbon in um, America, massive, huge cult following, huge passion. Uh, we're an event out there a few months ago and you know pe- people are obsessed they've got tattoos for their brands that they <laughs> they love they can tell you everything about the ingredients and the product and the product story and i totally echo that i mean when i joined the Azio, i didn't know i was a whiskey drinker but once you get into it and you figure out like there is this immer- immense world of like flavors and sensations that you can get and there is definitely something for you i know that we're not supposed to be promoting alcohol we drink responsibly and all but it's pretty amazing right yeah. and um i think that a lot of people like i was joining the agent that's how i got into the whole thing of exploring whiskeys right but lots of people during covid seems like they got into more that kind of exploration mode when it came to how do I indulge myself at home if I cannot go out and I started looking a lot online for different spirits uh, in whiskeys especially like what are the different types they want something smoky fruity lots of connoisseurs popping up suddenly um yeah. but I'm wondering from what you see now like we are a year well over the pandemic um, and people are back in bars. Is this trend still on? Like, do people search for that? Do they have the same passion going online and figuring out how do I digitally connect with this world that's so exciting? Yeah, and that's one of the things that I love about the what, what we're doing, particularly with bottles. And when, when we talked about you know, connecting the bottle, whether, mm-hmm. whether it's a bar 
touch point or whether it's in the home and the hands of the consumer those, those bottles and those physical experiences are still happening you know in covid in particular we got locked into our homes um, and i mentioned some of the work we we're doing with diageo before but but the one thing that was still going into consumers homes was the physical bottle itself so you know overnight you might have lost bus sides or outdoor media and all the other communications channel but your actual product was still um going into the homes of consumers and you know that one small label that sits on a Johnny Walker bottle, for example, you know, it does a good job of call out on a shelf. It doesn't do a great job of telling a massive story that sits behind uh, hundreds of years of that brand being in existence. So I, I love thinking about how we can tap or scan or digitally connect such a small piece of physical real estate to deliver such a big experience. I think consumers are still, they still want those experiences. We're still massively consuming digitally that hasn't changed we're going out a bit more but we're with our supercomputers the whole time that we're yeah. you know, checking and engaging with and a lot of the time we'll be in a bar experience shopping potentially for that but i've just had something that i loved i'll go and shop it uh, online or research it or connect with the brand so um that definitely that's it's as important that physical to um digital experience and um, the other thing you mentioned about um kind of the non non drinkers or actually you know the trend which is a true one that we're drinking less um we we've seen that some of the people that are taking ownership of of our products don't drink and they're taking ownership mm -hmm. love the brands they love the storytelling they're not taking it to consume they're taking it because it's a great asset maybe there's something relevant like it was produced in a birth year or there's something else that attracts them to that product um that they may sell in the future or gift or or do something else with um, and with the drinking less we're seeing and I think it's an industry trend as well that people are drinking less but they're drinking more premium they want better products they want that one or two drinks to be the very best one or two um, moments or experiences um, so we, we see I, I see that premiumization trend even in a time when you know cost of living and factors like that are impacting consumers we might have less but we're having better certainly in the spirits spirit space yeah another trend that we've seen as well and probably even before covid is personalization are you doing something around that space we, we are yeah every the the beauty of being focused on um digitally connecting things is that that just powers personalization it does a couple of things actually if we connect physical assets we get great data out um, and, you know, companies, uh, brands are after that data um, in good ways to do good things, you know, more relevant and, as you say, more personalised experiences. But, yeah, we, we're doing lots around, you know, if a consumer taps, takes ownership, connects with us, um, everything that goes beyond that moment, we're trying to make sure it's a personalised experience. And how can we use these new technologies? You know, we talk about blockchain, NFTs, uh, NFC tech, all of that, how can we use it to deliver more personalized experiences and, and more meaningful? We talk about that a lot, you know, we might want consumer data, but we want it to make it more personal, more meaningful experiences. And I love Yeah, and consumers expect that, right? They expect that they will go somewhere and they will find something that reflects a part of their personality. Yeah. So we want things to be digitized and perhaps even not interacting on a human level. But at the same time, going down to that human level because it reflects a part of me. Definitely. Yeah. And that's really in these types of categories where it's not, you know, such a commodity purchase. Um, that's even more important. Yeah, that reflects. For sure, there is. And I'm, I'm wondering because, okay, I understand the concept of the digital assets, right? So, you, not digital assets, the asset through the digital purchase. Um, but it's still like booze. <laughs> and uh, it, in the physical world, it has a big seasonality, especially like whiskey during Christmas, overall the ONT period, festive, um, and around the world on the different occasions that people celebrate. Because at the end of the day, I would say that Diageo has this part really well that they're in the business of celebration. I'm wondering, do you see this being reflected on your platform as well? Is there the same level of seasonality, gifting occasions? There is, I guess, in the cask, the kind of 
buying into a cast, there's less seasonality around that. That's that's pretty mm-hmm. we're not seeing big trends around seasons and not big drop offs as well, like you might expect in summer period. Yeah. We don't see the same there. Um I think outside of that, then in bottles, absolutely huge seasonality, particularly around gifting. Um we're we're doing a lot of work in the kind of how can technology improve and change that gifting experience. Now it's obviously if if you're, you know, a a bottle of Baileys or a smaller purchase, you gift quite quickly. But some of the bigger, higher consideration purchases, if I'm going to buy you a particular bottle of whiskey for your birthday because it represents a year or something like that, and I'm going to spend more on it, that's not a traditional gifting purchase, but we still try to push consumers into the traditional model. You know, I I walk through duty-free in an airport um, and I have to physically take that bottle with me to go on and gift it. So we're looking at how we can digitalize that as well um, so that you might be able to give ownership of that product without having to carry it out of the store at that point in time. Mm-hmm. Because we, the gifting is huge. We see a, a massive um, a massive interest there in the spirit space and de- definitely in terms of seasonality. And I think we touched upon the whole ca- buying a cask thing, right? And you said that it's not so much on seasonality here because it's a different kind of approach. Let's elaborate a bit more because I think it's very interesting for our listeners. Can you take us through the process? Like, how does this thing work? I buy a full cask in a distillery and it sits there waiting for me. Do I make gifts of and- bottles from my cask? Or is it only an investment which I intend to sell? Like, does it work both ways? And maybe worth clarifying what a cast yeah. is. Well, but I, I didn't know, for example. Yeah, so so I guess, yeah, to tell you, you know, what, what is a cast? So you'll have someone produce a cast. It being produced all of the time. Take Scotland as an example. Millions and millions of casts of spirit being produced um, each year. And again, with that brilliant craftsmanship that I, I talk about. Um, now, traditionally, those casts or barrels, you know, and if we're talking about bourbon in America, they'd be, be talking in terms of barrels. Um, they're filled with this wonderful liquid and then aged over a period of of years. Um, and you might have 250 to 300, 350 bottles within that one cask itself to give you an idea of the, the size. Um, and they're, they're what they call laid down. So they're filled, they're laid down, and they're looked after for a period of time. Um, now, you can take ownership of new filled casts, so a cast that's being filled today you could take ownership of. It'll cost you a lot less than, you know, say, a Macallan that's been matured for 20 years in that cask. Um, and tra- traditionally, you would maybe have a contact if you if you're a high wealth individual you might go and speak to a broker like you might have done with shares in the past um and that's your way into the market so really unless you know it's going to be pretty hard to access that car mm-hmm. market and one of the things we're trying to do is democratize that and make it accessible to everyone so whether you've got you know a thousand pounds or a few thousand pounds um, or millions of pounds, you can find a way digitally through our platform um, and through the tools we're creating to take ownership of that cask. Um, your kind of exit strategy on that, a lot of what we see is, you know, someone might be taking a new cask to sell in 10 years time, or they might be taking it to you know, because they've had a grandson born and they want him or her to have it at their wedding in 20 or 30 years' time and give everyone a bottle out of that cask. Um, How sweet is that? Which is an amazing use case. Yeah, it was, it was something that happened. It was actually a, an older cask that we sold, but it was to be bottled um, for for a wedding. Um, so a lot, a lot of the time what we do see, though, is that people are taking casks and they're, they're taking them as an investment to then sell on um, and, and make a profit on in the future. Yeah. You talked before about very ex- expensive items. <laughs> how? What does that mean in terms of logistics? Like, how do you make sure a bottle that costs, I don't know, $5,000 or even more probably? That's one of the things that's actually relatively mature. So, you know, whether you're storing a cask in a warehouse, and they, they call them bonded warehouses somewhere on the planet, um, or, or the same for bottle or you're shipping it. A lot of that stuff's very well established. You know, um, we talked about McAllen. They've been looking after these casts for hundreds of years, securely, um, safely in these environments. So that bit exists. What hasn't really existed until now is consumers' exposure to being able to 
to kind of buy and own a piece of that um, rather than just a bottle that you might buy on the shelf. Yes, I guess it is kind of like a new concept for consumers, right? So you see us asking lots of questions because we're also really trying to understand how this whole thing works, which seems super exciting. But I'm wondering, um, as you said, these are big brands usually, or at least for the, for the, for the big brands where that source from these distilleries, they have their own story. They have amazing um, brand assets, right? And I'm wondering in a platform such as this, you have to have an element of education to consumers and to offer them kind of a different experience versus what they are used to when they go to a liquor store or a supermarket or wherever they are buying their um um, also consuming, right, in a restaurant or a bar. And I'm wondering, so how do we merge those two? How do we ensure that we get the right brand experience and the way that you're working with your customers, and um, meaning the brands, to make sure that there is a seamless, uh, sober path and the way that people now interact in a completely different way still adheres to um, the original brand aesthetics, values, um, tone of voice and all that. Yeah, and this is where, so we're building lots of tech solutions around. Okay. When you look at things like cask ownership, it, there's mm-hmm. definitely complexities and you can see it in our conversation today. And we, we've got some really amazing things coming this year using things like AI to guide you on that journey so that's super exciting for us and in terms for me on the like the liquor store route and on the bottle itself it's always been the case that you just can't communicate and tell a big enough brand story from your pack and this is the same challenge whether you're Beam Suntory, Diageo, or your company like Nestle, um, they've got rich stories to tell. And actually, consumers do want those stories in their own terms when they ask for it, not serving me an ad during Netflix. Um, But when I'm with your product, being able to tell a story from that product is really important. And that's where our focus on connected packaging, connected bottle, um, connected products is is really interesting. So for the bigger companies that are trying to tell a story from their bottle we're looking at all sorts of technology you know the ability to mm-hmm. tap to, to scan um to deliver a brand experience and then tell that rich story in in relevant ways and some sometimes the platforms are there um to do it it's just how do you get to them you know diageo for example has got its own e-commerce it's got its own shop that exists they're right. big how do you get consumers to that experience how do you get them to the educational content or to meet the brand ambassador or the or the master distiller for example we're trying to use digital technologies to bring those stories to life the digital platforms and initiatives such as meta that we could say it's kind of more of an amplification of the brand story and exactly. finding ways to make it richer in the way that it's being communicated rather than uh, finding a different brand story that fits a new platform. Exactly that. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we, we talk about the kind of one element of what we're doing in the supply chain, the kind of hard <laughs> stuff is, is all around provenance. You know, can we tell you all of the ingredients, all of the materials, the carbon footprint, all of the things that consumers do want to know about that end product? Um, we, then in the middle, it's all about ownership and actually what are the new ways that we can dream up that consumers are going to take ownership of products in the future, whether it's a one-off product, a handbag, a bottle of spirits, a box of dog food, doesn't matter what's my new models of taking ownership of that product. When it's high-end or luxury, we then have considerations around things like secondary markets, which are really yeah. Um, And then finally, when I've actually got the physical product, how do I prove it's authentic and how do I get that rich brand story from it um, and the, the thing with whether you're a you know spirits companies i think it's 60 billion wines and spirits 60 billion bottles a year go into the hands and homes of consumers um fmcg companies five to ten trillion packs a year ship into consumers lives i mean that is a massive touch point which up until this point of time is pretty analog um when we're living in a world where everything's digitalized that's so many touch points that aren't generating data that aren't delivering an amazing digital brand experience. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Scenes, I guess our mission is how can we create meaningful use cases using the technology uh, to connect those trillions of touch points. 
Yeah. Which, by the way, and since we're talking about that, we, I will add your LinkedIn um, page to the show notes. If anyone, like if a spirits company, brand owner, uh, e-commerce manager is listening to this and wants to learn more about Metacast, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, drop us a connect on LinkedIn, def- definitely the way. Visit our website, have a look around. We've, we've just done a big launch um, for an Irish whiskey um, product, which is a, a beautiful piece of artwork. You, you take ownership of a bottle, but it's a one-off, fully customised, uh, beautiful piece of artwork as well. Um, so have a, have a look around the site. But yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'd love, love to talk more. Is that the collaboration with the artist that you did? It is, yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw that. That was so cool. Yeah, the artist is King Mix. And th- this is the thing around, you know, just looking at new models that that are changing things, that are adding more value. And this is, yeah, a beautiful piece of artwork. 501 bottles, uh, uh, th- this one-off, one-off collection. Um, each of them, a unique p- piece of that artwork that you can take ownership of. Um, and that's a, that's a really good example because you can take that bottle, redeem it if you want to and, and have the bottle shipped to you or you can digitally own it for forever if you want and it's held in a secure facility mm-hmm. and you can trade it then. You know, it might be, that's the two use cases. I love the bottle and I want to drink a great whiskey or actually I think this has got some value in it and I might keep it and hold it for the future. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you so... It this word the word out there that there's a slowdown in the boom of luxury goods. How are you seeing that, and what do you think is next? Um, l- luxury goods are pretty resilient if you look over long periods of time. So I think we are in a we you know we're in a year or two where there's a, a slight decline. But I think overall, um, luxury goods are, 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 are still a great long term bet, and you know will will continue to be um i mentioned that before around i think we're buying less but still buying better when it comes particularly when it comes to luxury um and i think that trend will will continue and um with everything that you've learned in your career rob in the different things that you've done and and now at metaclass if you had to go back to your younger self at the beginning of your career what would be, with everything that you've learned, that one piece of advice you would give yourself? Oof, God, that's a, that's a good one. Um, it's a pro- actually, I, I know this because it's advice that I'm still giving myself now around good people um, and surrounding yourself with with great people, I think is the best, you know, in your personal life, but definitely in your professional life. Um, talented, good good people um, around you is is critical. Like you can't do, you can't do life in either sense, um, with, without a good good team um, around you. And that's definitely, I, I'm an absolute control freak and will try and do everything if I can, but there's much better, more talented people um, in other areas than, than me, for sure. So I think building that team, and that's one of the things we're, we're trying to do um, and have done in previous kind of tech companies and startups, part of the biggest job. And once you've got a good product and you've got a market fit, the biggest job is the team around you to take that to market, uh, grow it, grow it sustainably, um, keep the great features coming. So that's probably the biggest one. Surround, so I just make sure I'm always surrounding myself with the very best and nicest people that are fun, fun to work with as well. This was Rob Holland, the CEO of Metacast. Christina, what are your key takeaways from this? I want to tell you the truth, uh, Daniel. While I have worked uh, extensively on e-commerce and specifically in the spirits uh, part of that uh, industry, um, I was very surprised to hear some uh, this unique use cases like this, uh, what was it, like the grandpa who was buying the cask so that it can get matured and then consume that uh, the uh, stepdaughter's wedding many years later. So I love that we're having this discussion that actually got us a little bit beyond what we consider to be e-commerce now mm-hmm. and uh, perhaps even getting a glimpse into the future, I would say, on how Digital tools uh, can enable transactions that go beyond just receiving 
um, something that is to be consumed now. And I, I don't know whether this is even FMCG or not anymore, right? Because we're stepping into a different place. Well, somebody did say, I did read somewhere the other day, or somebody told me that like all FMCG companies will end up being technology companies, right? So that that is an argument in favor of that, um, which I'm skeptical about personally. Um, we, we need to be skeptical on that sense, because <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, there is always going to be an actual product, which is like a bottle of something in that case to be consumed. But that's not the approach that Metacask has. It, it just builds on that and goes further beyond and think about how you can own something without ever uh, having it in your possession. Uh, it, it can be a cask, it can be a bottle that sits miles away in Scotland somewhere. And you are the owner of that. And this can be an amazing investment, or this can be something that you've bought for the future, not for immediate consumption, perhaps. And there is a lot more that you can do in that sense. Uh, thinking also about the levels of personalization, like uh, as uh, Rob was mentioning, the collaboration they are doing with that artist, I think that this kind of stuff is brilliant. Mm. And I guess it just uh, clings a little bit weird in our heads because we're not used to thinking of FMCG in that way. But yeah. when you think of fashion, how many articles have been out there about how what a great investment uh, Hermes bags are? I'm not suggesting that any of our listeners invest there. I have no idea if they're good or not, but I know that there is a conversation happening. And now we see that conversation through digital coming into the... Um, FMCG world. And I absolutely love that. Looking very much forward to see what next is there. Yeah, I think that one thing, my key takeaway, if you like, is that actually Metacask, it's not just an online retailer. Like a lot of times online retailers are just the digital version of a normal shop. Like mm -hmm. here you actually can buy digitally enhanced products that would not be possible without digital. Like, for example, the fact that democratizing casks or NFT related to a bottle. So I like the fact that it's really like high tech related to FMCG in a way, like creating that mm -hmm. experience of both. So I, th I thought that was very interesting. I think democratizing is the very right word to, to use here is breaking barriers for people who would not have normally access yeah. to that part of the world. Uh, so yes, I 100% agree with you, Daniel. Yeah, perfect. Well, I'm glad you agree with me, Christina. That's the best way to close this podcast today. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope our audience agrees with us as well. Thanks for joining and we'll see you in the next episode of the FMCG, guys. Have a great day. Bye.